Bonjour à tous. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Despite the heat, and thanks for sharing what's left of your attention span um, for this new panel discussion on a topic that uh, is of interest to all of us. Uh, we'll brainstorm together with our experts and panelists what could a globalized health look like? Uh, it could seem abstract, but it's not at all, of course, because we've all gone through two years of a pandemic. And COVID-19 raised uh, so many questions that we might uh, tackle tonight. Uh, so I'm a mouthpiece, and actually the brain uh, is Patricia Ogier. She's a member of the uh, Cercle des Économistes. She's a researcher uh, and at the ex marseille School of Economics. Together with us, uh, also to tackle the questions on your mind, Catherine Touvray. Hello. Shall I say a good afternoon or a good evening? Uh, I think we can still say good afternoon. She's at the head of Harmony Mutuelle. Uh, Laurent Rousseau, welcome, sir, who's the uh, general manager of SCORE. And Martin Hirsch, who was uh, at the head of the uh, public hospital network in the Paris region until very recently, so has first-hand experience in health uh, matters, uh, patients and all health workers. And this is a little teaser for you. We'll have a guest star who's the head of the WHO, uh, Mr. Gibraisis, uh, uh, who will tell us more about what he wishes for. But I'll let Patricia um, set the scene, uh, and then uh, our different panelists will uh, maybe uh, bring forward. So, uh, several Patricia. Uh, Apologies for that, who Patricia's uh, for you uh, now. Well, um, to tackle the question of transformations of our world, there are several questions we have to raise, especially after two years of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's uh, really been the first um, uh, concrete uh, illustration of globalized health. What lessons can we learn? Uh, first, did was there a fair management of people uh, suffering from the virus? Clearly, the answer is no. Vaccine coverage in emerging and developing countries was uh, very insufficient. Mid-November, 53% of world population had uh, received at least one dose, whereas that figure was below 7% for low-income countries. Came September 21, 75% of doses uh, were given in about a dozen countries only. So I think uh, the managing director of WHO will come back to that, this inequality uh, when it came to, bio, to the virus. Uh, COVAX, of course, the COVAX uh, scheme was set up, but it was not up to the task. A year more than a year down the line uh, after COVID, the COVAX scheme was set up, Africa had only received 2% of all vaccines. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so there was a shortage of vaccines. And uh, the reason for that is that there were not uh, sufficient uh, uh, production capacity uh, around the world. And a, a, a solution to that might have been the lifting, the temporary lift, um, waiving of um, patents. Uh, so there are arguments uh, pro and con uh, on custom and, uh, and excise uh, and patents. Uh, are these arguments uh, against the waiving of um, tax and patents? Are these arguments uh, admissible? We know that these patents are an incentive to R&D, but when it comes to health, it's more complex than that because health is a common, it's a common good. And research, medical research, is uh, financed 
by governments and states, COVID vaccines, it is estimated that public financing uh, given to nine pharmaceutical companies represented 43%, so that's uh, almost half of the total financing. Adding to that public financing over the last 20 years to um, develop uh, mRNA technology, uh, well, it is estimated that 97% of the financing of AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine came from public funding. So arguments against temporal waiving of uh, patents can be discussed uh, and disputed, but in the context of COVID, they are simply not admissible. And that proposal to waive uh, patents uh, put forward by India and South Africa and supported by over 100 countries was rejected by WTO since October 2020 and has only been uh, um, agreed to in uh, uh, June last, but in a very uh, watered down version. Only vaccines, not tests, nor drugs, and temporary waiving will only go for five years. Beyond the specific context of the pandemic, generally speaking, we should really insist on the fact that the current practice in terms of regulation uh, of pharmaceutical uh, market does not factor in public uh, investment in value creation in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, sector and that funding given to the private sector is without any conditions uh, attached to them. So risks in terms of R&D uh, are sort of mm, publicized or socialized, whereas uh, 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 that's uh, not true of the vaccine. As far as COVID went, benefits, quantities, prices, the choice of the few happy beneficiaries of uh, technology transfers, and even the selection of buyers, all of these were in the hands of pharmaceutical companies, and all of that was carried out uh, against the backdrop of a health emergency with, of course, millions of lives at stake. So can we reasonably globalize health on that basis? Clearly, the answer is no. And a third point I wanted to raise, can we go on being dependent on a small number of countries, especially China and India, for essential drugs? We know that China has become the leading um, producer of uh, active ingredients. Uh, uh, for example, uh, penicillin, uh, uh, 50% of ibuprofen, 60% of paracetamol, and beyond the necessity to diversify our supply chains, it would, from my perspective, would be might be more realistic rather than wanting to reorganize everything on a national scale or in, uh, in a European scale. We should wonder why pharmaceutical companies, re de you know, relocated in these countries, which uh, brings us to another question that needs raising as well. When we say globalizing health, does it mean also um, globalizing, and that is to say relocating pollution uh, connected to these industries? Relocating to Asia was a way of circumventing or bypassing um, environmental constraints. Uh, pharmaceutical companies thus make the most of a highly permissive um, a regulation on, uh, in terms of environment, uh, uh, environmental uh, 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 repercussions. These uh, industries are highly polluting, uh, and so uh, it begs the question of environmental and human costs. Uh, of course, that uh, it all depends uh, what kind of world we want to uh, build in the future. Uh, health is uh, directly linked with uh, e the economy. Uh, it's the very basis of human capital, and it is the basis for social, the social fabric, social cohesion. And as I said, health is a common, it is a common good. So if you want a more inclusive world, a fairer world, it would be imperative to uh, uh, ensure uh, health for all. But maybe I'll stop here.
Um, so, uh, what can we do to um, work towards uh, health uh, for all? You know that for these rencontres, uh, we often have the creme de la creme, the best experts uh, in their fields. And this panel will be no exception. Uh, world exclusivity, we have the uh, head of the WHO, uh, I don't want to get his name wrong, says the speaker, Mr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. Um, so, uh, sir, maybe you want to say something about uh, equality. Uh, let's hear the head of the WHO. Uh, over. Colleagues and friends, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed vast inequalities across and within countries. In 2020, WHO and partners created the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator to accelerate the development of life-saving tools to fight COVID-19 and ensure the equitable distribution of tools to fight the virus. Vaccines and tools were developed in record time but they were not distributed equally. We delivered over 1.5 billion vaccine doses through COVAX and lowered the cost of diagnostics and treatments. However, our job is far from over. Last year, hoarding of vaccines by a few countries was the major barrier to access. This year, it's distribution and uptake. I urge governments to increase their contributions to the ACT Accelerator using the fair share calculations set out in ACTA's financing framework. This will help bridge the equity gap, increase population immunity, and insulate against future waves. WHO is also working to put the tools directly in the hands of those who need them uh, the most by boosting local manufacturing in low- and middle-income countries. Last year, we helped establish the first technology transfer hub in South Africa. It's initially prioritizing mRNA vaccine technology, but in the future could expand to production of other vaccines and biotherapeutics. WHO will continue to support efforts to improve access to safe and effective medical products, to bring the pandemic under control, and drive a truly inclusive and sustainable recovery. I thank you. Well, we thank you, sir. Yes, I think that deserved a round of applause. Thank you very much, you, Dr. Uh, uh, Tedros for making the time. Of course, uh, that will uh, uh, probably prompt reactions. Uh, Catherine Touvre, uh, uh, please share your, your uh, viewpoint, but I'm sure that what the head of the uh, WHO um, really um, uh, said uh, 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 is going to uh, uh, prompt a reaction. Uh, we uh, mentioned uh, mentioned that the, the connection between public uh, stakeholders and the private sector. Um, you, as a stakeholder, uh, as part of the uh, uh, insurance sector, what role can you play? Well, first, I'd like to say that I'm delighted to take part in uh, uh, this um, uh, panel discussion. We are uh, a group of um, uh, private uh, health insurance uh, companies, uh, and we help uh, support uh, 10 million uh, French citizens uh, day in, day out. So I am uh, going to, 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 to speak from a field perspective. Uh, I'd like to respond to a few things that have been said about cooperation first. Uh, as we said, as we uh, as we saw uh, uh, during co the COVID pandemic, um, we need these cooperations so much, and we saw how it was more or less simple to develop them on a national, international scale, depending on the pre-existing frameworks or lack 
work of pre-existing framework. Uh, uh, because um, uh, acting um, uh, within these frameworks whilst also responding to an emergency crisis can be difficult. So we saw what could what was developed at, at, at a European scale. The uh, Europe Medicines Agency helped us and will help us some more in the future. Um, speaking uh, as uh, someone uh, coming from the field, uh, what I'd like to also uh, volunteer uh, 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 in terms of information, it's good to have um, vaccines tests, uh, technical tools, let's say, but nothing can be done without population, without um, engaging a population. So we saw that the acceptance of vaccines uh, was not a given. Um, and Patricia said, so health is a one of these commons. So, um, so it is about uh, how people live together and how we protect and, and nurture uh, social fabric. That is absolutely essential. And what I wanted to say, also picking up on what's been said, is that we see shortage of drugs. We saw that for vaccines, but we uh, observe the same. I'm thinking of uh, uh, the uh, hospitals in Lyon. They decided to associate with a startup company to uh, manufacture a drug drug for immunodepressed patients because uh, this drug is no longer available. So, and we're talking France in 2022, um, and we see it in our pharmacies, in hospitals or elsewhere, that this really pressing matter of shortage of drugs. So we talked uh, of um, uh, different scales, uh, local, uh, national, international. I don't want to uh, speak for too long, but we certainly hope that health will become a world uh, common good. Well, diseases certainly are uh, uh, something we have in, in uh, we, we, we have in common. So uh, with COVID and there's there are alerts on monkeypox at the moment. Uh, so this new form of uh, monkeypox. Uh, another word about the environment, it's very hot today, he said so, Patricia. Experts say that uh, with, an, uh, with an increase of two degrees, it's malaria coming back to our countries. So, or, or, or uh, because, uh, you know, countries in the south are more familiar with malaria than we are. Uh, so those are just uh, a few things I wanted to say to fuel the discussion on this topic that you uh, proposed. Laurent, I'm going to give you the floor uh, so that you can share your viewpoint. What Catherine said was extremely hands-on, extremely practical as we prepare this panel discussion, because we do prepare. Uh, may, uh, what you said, um, uh, and what you insisted on is data sharing. And we realized during COVID that it's something we thought was fully globalized. We think of our smartphones, the internet, but actually when it comes to health, it's not that easy. Absolutely. Well, I speak from an insurer's point of view and a reinsurer's point of view. So our uh, core business is about ensuring these uh, lives and the health uh, of people. So I am uh, um, a risk practitioner, if uh, I can put it like that. Uh, health shouldn't induce more anxiety, but uh, risk is about risk management. Uh, it's about defining these risks. Uh, and technology is absolutely essential uh, in my view. Firstly, if we define the different types of risks and if we look at health, there's a first parameter that is frequency and severity. So, uh, uh, there are, so health risks can be about uh, frequent uh, frequency and also about uh, a severity. Is it a local risk or is it a global risk? Well, it's both, really. There are uh, global issues and the pandemic was definitely a world risk. And it's uh, it's actually developed ever since uh, ancient times with the development of trade. And we saw that pandemics were part and parcel of world uh, and, and globalized economies. So not only about, um, you know, um, uh, caring for uh, uh, bodies, but also uh, mental health. Uh, uh, so we have to have a, a holistic vision of health. 
Um, so, to draw the link with data, data uh, is essential uh, from two perspectives. To be able to manage risks, you have to know, uh, to have good knowledge of that risks. And as insurance, uh, as insurers, we invest in uh, uh, gaining a better knowledge of risks. To give you a very uh, simple example, we've developed a uh, a model uh, 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 and and model modelization for uh, um, uh, breast cancer. You know, the U.S. is the, the the country of statistics. Well, we saw that the CDC, Johns Hopkins uh, data that was very useful, and for COVID and COVID was a case in point because we saw that data was fully globalized. We've used data coming from a, a, a variety of sources. So upstream from um, risk management, we have to really break silos when it comes to uh, data. There were initiatives in France, but we're not exactly a step forward in that regard. Uh, and there's also data uh, when it comes to what's downstream from risks per se. There's vaccines and also access to vaccines. Uh, health pathways have to be really patient-centric and not hospital-centric. And Martin Hirsch will no doubt have something to say about that. Um, we saw that COVID and technology uh, brought forward a development of telemedicine. Um, and it's a complement to, uh, uh, you know, being able to, to uh, uh, see a, a, a doctor in person. It's important to stress that it's a complement and technology will uh, uh, play an important part. What is the role of each and every one of us? Well, we have to be, you know, um, really empowered in that regard. And then there's the question of public authorities on a national scale and on a local scale. They have a role to play. And there's a third level, which is about uh, really uh, mutualization, and that's where insurers and reinsurers play a part. And then there's the systemic scale, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, across governments and uh, across uh, public authorities. So to me, it's absolutely essential to uh, tackle health as a global risk, a risk for the whole of humanity. And it's all the more important when we see borders coming back up and the world fragmenting. Thank you very much. So, Martin Hirsch, we have billions of questions to ask. We can't ask them all, but the first question that I wanted to ask, to share with you, we've actually mentioned it earlier, the topic of today is globalizing health. You were at the head of BHP. We all know what's happening now in public health, what the uh, ER sectors actually are going through. You're talking about local scale and national scale, as if everything was actually uh, linked. In. Does it have a link with the globalization of health as we see it today, or is it just a side phenomenon? And my question is actually uh, uh, not, uh, not a case in point at all, not topical at all. No, actually not. The crisis that we actually see in the public health system, as we read it in the uh, in the newspapers, the nurses and so on, is it something that is typically French or is it something that is seen worldwide? Eh, well, it is something that we see worldwide. I will go back to the introduction that was made and I'll try to be provocative once again. Maybe we shouldn't vaccinate the whole population. Maybe it was wrong to, ha to set this goal, to vaccinate the whole world. I'm sorry. For France, we should be all vaccinated. I hope it's not anti-vax that are actually giving me a round of applause. Please don't be mistaken with what I'm saying. At one point, we said 75% of the population of African countries should get vaccine. The authorities of these countries considered that this figure was not relevant because they were younger, the way of life was different, the dissemination of the virus was different, and maybe they needed something else. It doesn't mean that there was no problem all in terms of access to health. I'm, I, I'm not saying that. I'm not questioning this. But when we look back, 
uh, with uh, UNITED and the WHO, they, we could see that they were able to give HIV medicine, but also tubic tuberculosis uh, drugs, but also malaria drugs for at prices that were higher. And negotiations took place, and they were quite interesting. And that had actually a stronger impact than vaccination. Look at the, the mortality rate per c a country. But anyway, this is all a matter of uh, debate, and I don't want to go back to that. When we talk about globalization, let's talk about the hierarchy in terms of the uh, top countries, in terms of as access to help. We would say that it's like we would think that normally it would be the wealthiest countries and that the most performing ones should be the US, Germany, France, UK, some Scandinavian countries, and Switzerland. But that's not the case. This is not what we see. Because the COVID stakes that were actually the resuscitation beds, mainly, that was what, that was, what was at stake. But it was also Mike uh, mask pr uh, provisioning, respecting a certain number of rules. And that was actually something that a lot of countries could do, and they didn't need to have a high technicity. And actually, when you have some country that spend 20% of their GDP, that we could say that they actually made a lot of mistakes uh, with COVID, because we were having a president that was saying a lot of uh, BS in regards to, uh, when regards to the uh, COVID for instance, but when we look at the other countries, those that are not top countries in terms of wealth, and they manage to uh, handle that quite well. We have a lot of debates because that are actually fascinated if we talk about China and others, but I think that helps us to uh, think about this in a different way. Uh, it's not a matter of having uh, three organs uh, uh, at once in a single in, in in a single surgery it's also a matter of knowing whether you can have public health policy uh, and during the 21st century let's think about let's remember Claude Bernard and others that could be interesting second subject which is dear to my heart we're going from the world to Europe now Europe well it managed to change conceptually. I remember when I was uh, talking about, I was dealing with uh, food security. They were trying to prevent some measures to that were protecting health. I'm actually uh, making things bigger than they are, but there were some countries that forbade to feed cows uh, from, uh, from meat, that actually they were meeting. That, that was actually to have some commercial barriers. And that was actually what was happening with help, is to work against a single market. But here, what, we, what did we have with the COVID? It was wonderful. We had everyone buying together vaccines, and it was a major U-turn in, in terms of concept. We should continue this, this way, in this path. And there are a lot of states that didn't do that, maybe because they didn't think that it was necessary or they thought that they had other alternatives. But this was a huge breakthrough, and this is something that we will not change now. And that can open a lot of doors, including in terms of uh, manufacturing of drugs. I'll go back to that. Uh, vaccines cost a few euros per vaccine. Until Tuesday, I was the director of hospitals of Paris for one person. I don't know how we can ensure it, but one person, one treatment, one person, one treatment, 500,000 euros, one drug. 500,000, Carticel, that's the name. It's something that works, actually. All good. But today, for some very specific leukemias, we're working really hard to uh, make sure that this can help for other forms of cancers. And we go from a few thousands at the scale of France to dozens of thousands. This economic model cannot be scaled up. So we have to reorganize it. S two other subjects 
that I would like to tackle, and that seem, that seem important for me. What has changed uh, during the last 20 years, when we had actually a map of uh, health insurance, we had a map of the old Europe, where we had the US, which had the strange system, and then Japan, the OCDE, plus countries and the insurance, the health insurance and social benefits made a lot of progress in Latin America, in China, in Africa. Of course, there were inequalities. It was not perfect. It was not the Bismarck system, of course, but that managed to make things in a solvent, solvent. And there were requests from the UN after the 2008 crisis. And we realized that during the 2008 crisis, the, the countries that managed to handle that world well were the ones that are managed to have a social welfare system, a protection for their citizens. And these last 15 years, we saw a change of landscape that was quite radical in terms of payment, the uh, repayment, Everything can be done with a mobile phone in much uh, straight, uh, much simpler conditions that uh, much simpler than what we had before. I have 15 examples, but I'm going to give you one: the shortage of the health professionals, and that is actually having a link with what we have in the hospitals in France. I was in New York a month ago; they have no shrink anymore at night. There are two guys in a corner who are dealing with emergencies for the 17 emergency services in Berlin in January. We were having a lot of problems. They had 43% of their beds that were actually closed. And I'm not talking about health professionals in a certain number of countries from Africa. Shortage of doctors, of vets, of nurses, and so on and so forth. The WHO thinks that in 10 years to come, 10 million health professionals are going to be lacking. So we have a huge challenge to overcome with regards to shortages. And that actually is taking place in, in, in most countries. We have to find a local response, a local answer to that problem, but also a global one when it comes to health com professionals. That is of uh, crucial importance. And we need to change the health professional format because the health professionals of today will not be the ones that we used to have 30 years ago. Everybody wants to react to what was said. Patricia, Laurent, and Catherine, you have the floor. I would like to follow up on what was said on two subjects. In line with, Catherine, with what Catherine said, as to the acceptance of vaccines, in which way countries can set up can improve their capacities. In 2019, the World Index of uh, Health Security placed, ranked uh, the US at the first, as a top country, as the best country to handle an epidemic. The second one was UK. So that actually raises the question of how can country implement uh, their capacities, their theoretical capacities. There was a huge discrepancy between these indexes and reality and, and, what, and the consequences that we could see. I will also like to react to what you said, Martin. I'm always embarrassed when we make that type of declaration. We are reaching our fourth doses, dose and we're about to say, OK, just uh, wear masks and wash your hands, and that will be fine, you know? No, we should give the opportunity to these countries to get vaccinated if they want to. Mortality linked to COVID is not known in the southern countries, and that's a matter of data statistics. There are certainly more uh, disease in the south and in the, in the north. In South Africa, for instance, the youth were was hugely impacted in Tunisia. People were dying in the, in the halls of the hospital. In India, it was terrible. 
I'm very much embarrassed. Of course, the vaccine may not be uh, the magic solution, but it's actually very embarrassing for us as a northern country to say, okay, uh, we have used, we have chosen this option, but you should uh, choose for others. I was actually a chief of staff of uh, Mr. Kushner. We say that the drugs are in the north and the sick people are in the south. We should not keep our eight doses of vaccine here. I'm not saying that, but in terms of public health, maybe what could be more useful. And of course, we need to make sure that these countries can allocate a part of their GDP to vaccines and they should have subsidies as well from outside. But the most useful tool for public health reasons due to their demographic, to their uh, age pyramid. Is it really the vaccine? Is it the COVID vaccine? Or maybe we should opt for other treatments. And I think we should be able to ask the question. There's no shortage anymore, but they remain very costly. So we should at least give them the opportunity, the opportunity to manufacture them. We we still have intellectual uh, intellectual property rights on. We haven't renounced to them. And, and there was a lot of battles to make sure that they could have the license to manufacture m vaccines. And we didn't give them the opportunity. Of course, the WTO also uh, tried to give the opportunity to these countries to decide that some manufacturers could that, that there was this possibility to manufacture these vaccines without the, the authorization from the manufacturers. And actually, uh, COVID a vaccine is much easier than the messenger RNA. And there needs to be a transfer technology, and we should ask for cooperation from our industrial, our industrial sector. I would like to, uh, to speak. Catherine, you wanted to say something. Yes, I would like to follow up on this because populations and social behaviors are both the problem and the solution, as you have said. I'll take two examples. Vietnam during COVID. I had a son in Vietnam in January 2020. They were flabbergasted when they saw our behavior because we didn't wash our hands, because they didn't take any precautions when they would get into shops. So there's a strong social pressure as well. And something else also that I would like to say, health is not only a matter of sicknesses, it's also a matter of health capital. Guy Valencia was uh, talking in Ronalp, there's about the same population as in Denmark, 78 hospitals in Auvergne Ronalp, 21 in Denmark, and life expectancy is 10 years longer in Denmark than in Auvergne Ronalp. Also, we can see that the subject of health, it's a collective and social issue. It's not a matter of being sick or not. And I would like to say that on top of everything that was said, I would like to follow up on this as well. We've had a crisis, we've had an epidemic, we're trying to draw in conclusions, but we don't have enough hindsight. We all have a mask in our bag still. It's a matter of crisis management. And as an insurer and reinsurer, I'm saying that we should look up things upstream and anticipate things. Prevention is very important. We need to have prevention mechanisms with uh, all have in mind the matter of shortage of masks. How can we anticipate this? There's a matter of technology also that, that is very important. Information sharing is important. And also what Patricia said, which is quite disturbing, is a matter of funding. How can we fund investments? How can we absorb and dampen risks? Because we have insurance claims, we have a lot of bills to pay, we need to have a financial system that can hold up. How can we have a straightforward vision of what solidarity is at the national or international level and what is a matter of uh, pooling of uh, risk? And if we can't face this reality, this reality of risk, and when it's likely to occur, when it can be very severe and we have to quantify it, 
and we need a financier to actually support this when we have this risk because we often uh, make a mistake and confuse it with public health expenditure. We have to talk about risk, about random risk, because if something happens, we have to know how we can pay for it, and we have to anticipate and manage risks upstream. I have a question, because both of you are private sector stakeholders. We've heard the WHO uh, director who was talking about solidarity and in s inducing us to be to have the solidarity spirit. We're talking about globalization. So Patricia was talking about bio and tech and the importance of uh, public investment in vaccines. When we look at Pfizer profits, and I'm not trying to be anti-capitalist, take care, but their profits are just significant. How can they actually earn so much money on public health? Do they have a role to play? In a proposal such as the director of WHO was uh, was uh, making, or maybe it's just up to the states, to the public health authorities to say that beyond the uh, traditional social uh, social insurance system, we could have an insurance, a health insurance, and it's up to us to do it. Or, or do you want to play your role and not only anticipate risk? I can tell you a story that's for Laurent to illustrate what he's just said. Beginning of April, there was a lady doctor who wrote to me and she said, I'm working in the resuscitation department with my husband. We've uh, resumed work after getting COVID, but we're happy to work. Thank you for everything you're doing, and so on. And she added something. We should have, we, we had planned to um, buy an apartment, but when we signed, the insurance was uh, refused to us because we had had COVID. And I called this great insurance company, and I said, well, I guess there must have been a mistake. And I said, no, we, we can't. We don't know how to insure ourselves, so we refuse to uh, insure anyone that got COVID. And so, fortunately enough, things changed afterwards. But that shows the difficulties that we can face. Second remark that I would like to make. The countries where the tests are free or actually are made for a fee, It's, uh, of course, better to have free tests, and it's important for the public health authorities to uh, pay up and to make sure that these tests are free, because otherwise we'll have people that would refuse to get tested because they don't want to pay 15 euros, 35 euros, or 50 euros. And, and that would actually entail much more a bigger dissemination of the virus. And we've seen it in other countries. So the free access to a certain number of things that would protect in, in the individual, but also the society at large, is actually very important. And that needs to be regulated. Thank you. That's a very good sub, uh, point. Let's not. Let's not forget that uh, insurers certainly were not full of glory and were not, and bankers were the uh, devils and the villains before, but now it's actually the insurance company. And I would like to report something that a booklet, there's a booklet at the entrance of this um, tent, the title of which is actually uh, Sickness Insurance, a Partner of Welfare. That comes from the Allen Company. It's six years old. And what I want to say is that as long as the insurance company will only talk about risk and will not have an added value to the individual and to the society at large and will not provide us assistance, we can actually extend that to real estate, to helping elderly. It can be strategic for the insurance companies. I'm actually utterly convinced about this. We cannot pay everything when the pandemic was actually uh, rampant, when we have a systemic systems, 
when everything is at the same place at the same time, the, uh, the insurance company cannot work because we cannot actually pay insurance claims with the premiums of others. And this is where we have to work together with international institutions. And that's where, where the role of the insurance companies has, has to be reviewed and, and showed that it had a boundaries. My answer would be yes. I'm rather for a socialization, maybe private or public. The individual cannot be left alone, especially when we talk about costs, as were mentioned earlier. I certainly believe in public policy, and I think that we should have a complementarity between the public and private sector. We are a complementary insurance company. We're not public, we're not private, we're a bit of, every, of the two. And so there's certainly a complementarity in the definition of basket of healthcare because we, we have to know what we're talking about and also in the way we define the actions that the individuals can uh, do to make sure that initiatives can uh, be undertaken for prevention purposes and to not to go back to the 19th century public health care system, as was said. We still have a few minutes, but since I have all the questions, I would like to ask one to the four of you to maybe to wrap up everything that was said this afternoon. COVID-19 pandemic does it constitute for the global health in terms of tools, in terms of uh, stakeholders? Is it a major challenge that weakens its principles and foundations? And that should entail, entail a huge overhaul, a huge change in the, in the world public health system. You have three hours. I would like to start. I think there was an Obama advisor who said that we shouldn't spoil the crisis. I think that gives the basics for something that didn't exist. There is something that is now possible. Conceptual changes are taking place, so I want to be optimistic. I agree. Bearing in mind, bearing in mind the human nature, we know it. We know that the bad habits are going to come back. So we should have a longer memory. My answer would be threefold when we talk about crisis. When we have a crisis, the good thing about it, is the silver lining is that we have wonderful innovations. In 2020, we thought, how can we solve a problem? When we have all, all patients, if all the patients actually have COVID, even not severe cases, and they go to the ER hospitals were dead, and if we don't help them, they're going to be dead. And so we have COVID done that was actually created, and we managed to have to follow 600,000 uh, patients that were monitored from home. And in six days, we had an app that managed to monitor them daily. And when we needed to send an ambulance, we could do it easily. There are a lot of examples like this, a lot of examples of innovations. Every day, when you see that we are able to have 100% of hundreds of thousands, millions of tests that are being done, that are being carried out, and that actually feed a single system of data, this is wonderful, this is amazing. And then, obviously, we uh, epidemics and viruses and bacteria do not know any borders. But a lot of countries actually are reluctant to show that they, are, that they have weaknesses in terms of their public health system. We all pre pretend to have the best public health system. And when we see that actually we manage to have problems for such and such sickness, it's actually a matter of showing that we are weak and, and admitting that we are weak. And we tend to hide that. And this is why we do not do a lot of uh, trans-border 
epidemiology. It's very weak, and we should expand on that. We had a partnership with the University of Guan, so we thought that we had the best information, the most recent information, and then we realized that it was fake information. And then thirdly, we should review all the concepts and see how we should combine freedom, public health policy efficiency, and uh, pooling of the expenditure. And in this way, we would have new bases, and we should keep the values and the principles that we have created in the 19th century, but we should adapt them to a different reality. It's up to you to wrap up now, because we can see that the t time has uh, flown, that we are running out of time. So to answer the question that was asked, we should change the rules of the game, clearly. And this COVID episode showed us that we should change the rules of the game. What does it mean? It means that we should give more power to national institutions, but also, and above all, to international institutions, WHO especially. I don't know if we should keep the WHO in its actual format. It's also a matter of uh, knowing whether we are um, able and willing to lose our freedom somehow, somewhat, to help solve crisis. We saw that there was the IMF after the Second World War. We need to have institutions, international institutions, that are taking on power further to crisis. So let's hope that in the, world, in the realm of health, further to the COVID crisis, we could have uh, more power f uh, within uh, within the international, um, uh, international institutions, and we should have better public-private partnerships. Because it's all, it's the duty of each and every one to help, to help fight against these crises. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank also the director of WHO, and we will continue. Let's see you soon. Bye-bye.